So, in the last class we looked at uh, the organization of matter in nature at different levels and the ecology that is focusing on organism, population, community, ecosystem uh, towards biosphere. And when it comes to organisms and population, we were discussing the, uh, the population dynamics and how it is controlled in a, in, in a population or in a community. So, there are various uh, um, models which controls the, which uh, gives us an idea of the population that is in a community that is growing. So, the logistic model of population growth uh, essentially defines the uh, growth of a population of population in the absence of competition. So, it is a sigmoidal curve which tapers off to an equilibrium level uh, which is limited by either the resources or the or some other external factors. <coughs> so, the sigmoidal growth histories reflect changing intensities of competition, fecundity or the rate at which individual produce offspring should be high when there is plenty of food supply that is high intrinsic rate of increase and fecundity is survival or both should drop when there is crowding or when the population is increase, increases and population growth would slow until it ceased altogether. So, in a logistic model also the population cannot go on growing uh, indefinitely, it will crash at some point when it is exceeding the carrying capacity of the, uh, of the ecosystem. So, now when it comes to, uh, when there are two multiple species exist in an ecosystem, the Lotka Volterra model uh, uh, defines the competition in the, uh, in between species. If populations of two species compete for a resource, it must follow that the carrying capacity of habitat for each is reduced from what it would have been if one species were in sole occupancy. So, if only one species was there that would have been using all the resources, but now when two, two, two species comes into the population there is competition and the carrying capacity gets reduced because of the competition between the two species. This will result in the elimination of one species eventually if it carries on the competition is tough. So, the Lolka Volterra model is the simplest model which actually also can be used for prey predator relationships uh, or interactions in a particular um, habit, uh, habitat or in an ecosystem. The model was developed independently by Lotka and Volterra in 1925-26 period. It has two variables P and H and several parameters that affect the equation. So, it is defined by two independent equations. So, the first equation is the uh, variation of the density of the prey that is defi defined as dH by dt which is given by Rh minus AHP where H is the density of prey, R is the intrinsic rate of prey population increase. That is in the absence of any predator, how much population of that prey can grow with uh, given resources in the, in the ecosystem. Then similarly, P is the density of predators. So, and uh, so to determine R, the intrinsic rate of prey population growth, we need to uh, consider that prey population, predator population is 0. A is the predation rate coefficient that also determines how much in the presence of predator how the prey population is changing. B is the reproduction rate of predators per one prey eaten. So, that dictates how many predators will be there. So, dp by dt is the rate of increase of the predator um, by eating the prey. So, B gives the reproduction rate of predators per one prey in the eaten and m is the mortality rate of the predator. So, these two equations are uh, uh, use for uh, defining the the in the specific competition or the inter uh, interaction between a prey predator population. So, there are diff different parameters uh, that are used in this Lotka Volterra model and how this is uh, how we one measures these parameters are the following set of experiments can be done for example, keep prey population without predators and estimate the intrinsic rate of increase that we have done in the case of logistic model, you, you give enough uh, resources to the prey species and then keep uh, counting the number of uh, individuals in the community as with time and that gives the in intrinsic rate of increase of the population of the prey. Then put one predator in cages with different densities of prey <coughs> and estimate prey mortality rate and corresponding gay value. So, this experiment can be done in lab using a small uh, um, insects like lady beetle and aphids. Uh, so, for example, lady beetle eats aphids. Uh, an example is that lady beetle killed 60 aphids out of 100 in 2 days. Then, uh, for example, can, we can determine the k value as equal to lo minus ln of 1 minus 60 by 100 which is equal to 0.92 and A in this case is equal to 92 by 2. That is uh, the k value equals to the instantaneous mortality rate multiplied by time. 
thus the predation rate equals to the that is the A which is the predation rate equals to the k value divided by the duration of experiment. So, the if it is 2 days that is by 0.92 by 2, 2 that is uh, given for. So, that gives us a value for per day uh, predation rate. So, if A values estimated at different prey densities are not close enough to each other then the Lotka Volterra model will not work. So, you can change the prey densities and then estimate whether the values that we get the value of A that we get is close to each other. So, then that says that whether the model will work uh, to define the uh, relationship between a prey predator composition in a in an ecosystem. However, the model can be modified to incorporate the relation of a prey density in this case. Similarly, parameters such as B and M, how do we determine that? So, what do you do is keep constant density of prey, example H is equal to 0, 5, 10, 20, 100, 100 prey per, prey per cage and estimate the intrinsic rate of predator population increase. So, you just keep let us say 5 preys or 10 preys in a particular cage and then uh, estimate how many of those um, uh, the lady beetles are growing at what rate and then that will that or the predator, uh, predator is growing at what rate and that at these densities of prey. Plot the intrinsic rate of predator population increase versus prey density. So, one can get a linear regression from this and that gives us the which is an RP which is equal to BH minus M that if you plot this graph we can get the which is uh, it is a straight line and then from there you can get B and M values and which which can be used in the Lotka uh, model uh, for to get um, these two. So, the first equation is to get uh, first uh, experiment was to get R and H and the second experiment is to get B and M which is which are parameters affecting the predator uh, population growth R and A are the values which affect the prey population growth. So, these two values will decide how the interaction between these two species happen in the system. So, now we will summarize what we have looked at so far um, uh, in uh, the important concepts that one needs to look in ecology. The ecology is a vast subject which requires uh, uh, as it is a science of the universe as somebody has defined earlier and but it requires a lot of uh, uh, detail time and analysis to study the, the, uh, the interactions of different species different communities and how they coexist or in, and how life exists in, in on earth itself. So, the we are summarizing some of the uh, important points here. So, one of the questions that we, we ask is what keeps us and other, other organisms alive on earth. The earth's life support system has major component four major components that interact with each other that we have to take into account and we have to remember that is the atmosphere that is air, the hydrosphere the water, the geosphere which is consisting of rock, soil and sediment and the biosphere which is the uh, which consisting of the living uh, things. So, we, we have defined that you know how life uh, and, and this and also we remember that life exists in land and water. Terrestrial, um, terrestrial, so we classify this life that is existing on uh, terrestrial uh, systems into biomes which, which are nothing but large regions such as forests. So, the term biomes is used to classify large regions such as forests, deserts, grasslands, etc. with distinct climates and species that uh, particular species that exist in those biomes. The three major factors that sustain life on earth are one way flow of quality energy from the sun and through living systems through the process of food, uh, uh, food, food, food web uh, or the second is the cycling of nutrients and matter in the living systems um, and the non-living systems Gravi and third is the gravity which allows the planet to hold on to its atmosphere which is very important for us to have the living condition being established here and also the movement of organisms on the on earth etc are also dictated by the gravity. Similarly, what are the major components of an ecosystem? Uh, so, when we define ecosystem, ecosystems we have defined earlier as consisting of living and non-living components which interact and forms the ecosystem and abiotic factors can limit the population growth because they are the this is the nutrient uh, cycling that is important which has to reach the living systems by nutrient cycling. We will soon see what are those nutrient cycles 
and uh, so that limit that can limit the population growth for example if nitrogen is in limited supply in an agriculture field we know that the production will uh, reduce so similarly there are vital nutrients micronutrients and micronutrients which are needed for the growth and well being of organisms for example vitamins are very important for the well being of humans it is not the food uh, that we eat uh, alone uh, which gives us energy alone is not sufficient for our biomass growth we need also some vital supplements of uh, micronutrients, uh, elements like metals and other things, other elements like calcium, magnesium uh, and some other uh, trace elements sometimes zinc, all these are required for the well-being and, and the for the living systems. So, abiotic factors can limit population growth due to these uh, aspects. Uh, similarly, producers which are also known as autotrophs which means they can produce their own energy and consumers or heterotrophs which feed upon others are the living components in this uh, ecosystem. Energy flow and nutrient cycling sustain ecosystems and biosphere. These are the important points that we have to remember ab about ecosystems. It is nothing but a mechanism for energy flow which is coming from the solar system or the sun from the sun to reach uh, organisms and then um, maintain life on earth. So, what happens to matter in ecosystems? We have discussed energy flow in ecosystems and the efficiency with which energy flows in living systems. So, which can be calculated using in the case of plants it is estimated using net primary productivity and the efficiency and the efficiency varies according to uh, in different ecosystems that we have looked at and we said uh, we have also seen that the efficiency of certain ecosystems are much higher than others because of probably the biodiversity that exists there. So, uh, similarly matter all also, um, also flows in the ecosystems. So, uh, mostly matter in the form of nutrient cycle what we call as biogeochemical cycles within and among ecosystems and the bios biosphere. So, that is how the matter uh, gets circulated in the, uh, in the ecosystem and between ecosystems and the biosphere. So, certain components have uh, when you look at hydrology cycle or when you look at carbon cycle or most of the cycles have both uh, atmosphere as well as uh, uh, living systems are involved. Human activities are majorly altering this chemical, this biogeochemical cycles. Uh, we will soon see those uh, cycles. So, the cycles which we which we are aware of that controls life on earth are water or hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle and sulphur cycle. Let us take a look at for example, nitrogen cycle. So, in this diagram there are natural pathways in which uh, nitrogen is uh, so nitrogen cycle operates in, on earth and red arrows indicate the pathways which are affected by human activities. So, there are many uh, many of this uh, nat natural geo bio geochemical cycles are uh, affected today by human activities example is given in the case of this nitrogen cycle here. So, for example, nitrogen oxides which are uh, from burning fuel and using inorganic fertilizers are released into the atmosphere and that affects again the um, other natural uh, flow of nitrogen into the, uh, in the in the environment. So, there are processes and reservoirs one can see in different colors. The blue colors indicates processes that go on in regenerating the nitrogen and back into the cycle and uh, reservoirs are where uh, nitrogen is stored for certain time period. For example, nitrogen lost to deep ocean sediments, nitrogen in ocean sediments, ammonia in soil etcetera are examples of reservoirs. And, uh, and processes like electrical storms or uh, lightning for example, volcanic activity, decomposition by, um, by uh, decomposition by microbes, uptake by plants etcetera are processes which go on uh, by in converting one form of nitrogen to another form or it is taken up by plants. So, one can see and nitrogen in plants and animals are also considered as reservoirs because uh, they may take time before they get back into the system. Similarly, if you look at the uh, phosphorus cycle which is also again affected by human activities one examples are mining waste, sewage, fertilizers, um, uh, uh, detergents all these for example can um, uh, sewage is essentially because of uh, detergents that we use sometimes have polyphosphates which are used as builders which comes into the water body and then it uh, runs off and reaches water bodies. So, again there are these are reservoirs of the phosphates. So, in the in the water bodies they get again converted. So, the pathways are affected by human activities by excessively releasing certain phosphates into the 
water bodies and it affects the uh, biological cycle of, cycle in the aquatic as well as in the terrestrial ecosystems when water is consumed by organisms and water is also used by um, aquatic organisms. Similarly, sulphur also uh, the pathways are again affected by smelting, burning coil, coil uh, coal and uh, refining uh, fossil fuels uh, or use of fossil fuels also releases sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere and uh, uh, so basically you can see the uh, it affects the uh, sulphur cycle as well. Carbon is a major cycle which is affecting affected by human activities and uh, one, one knows that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is one of the reason for the um, uh, maintaining the temperature, uh, uh, maintaining the temperature and it, it forms only 0 0.03 percent by volume in the atmosphere. However, it affects the uh, or it, 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 it dictates the temperature control of uh, our planet. So, we all know that the climate change is one of the factors which are affected by the carbon cycle in a major way and also the hydrologic cycle. So, all this uh, biogeochemical cycles can affect climate as well as the, the uh, existence of life on earth. So, it is important for us to take into account how this non-living and non-living part or the abiotic part of ecosystem affects life cycle on life itself on earth and uh, how it affects ecosystems and their maintenance. Similarly, another point that we need to summarize is about biodiversity and evolution. So, these are two points we touched upon what is biodiversity and why is it important. So, biological diversity is the variety of earth species, the genetic diversity, the ecosystem they live in and the ecosystem processes such as the energy and material flow that sustains all life. So, this is essentially not just uh, the diversity of the living beings that we see around us is not the only way to explain biodiversity. It is the as it is given here there are uh, four major components for earth's diversity which is uh, which can be called as ecological diversity that is the variety of ter terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems that we see around. Second is functional diversity because uh, there are many functions served by the ecosystems. Genetic diversity, so the genetic pool of different organisms for example, if you take you know if you if you consider fish there are many different species of fish which are genetically very different in a particular pond or a lake that we take as a uh, an example ecosystem. Species diver diversity, so, uh, so these are the four major components that we see on earth uh, as we go um, from one region to another or when we consider biomes. Um, so, you can see different um, forms of life exist and this diversity is that is uh, contributing to biodiversity. So, the biodiversity is a vital renewable resource for all life on earth. So, that is the most important message that we have to keep in mind and, uh, and to make life sustainable on earth biodiversity is very, very necessary. And, and as far as our human understanding is concerned uh, of all the research that we have done so far with the scientists uh, finding out how many species are there. Among uh, out of the 400 million species on earth, we have only identified 1.8 million species and uh, there are thousands of species discovered every year or, uh, to ident or identified every year uh, which we do not know what their functions are, what is, uh, what, do, what exactly their contributions are etc. But e is it important for us to know it? No. Each of them have a unique function to serve on, on the planet and that is why it is important to have each or each and every species. So, and where do species come from? So, the definition uh, or the understanding of species, where do species originate or the everyone is aware of the book origin of species. So, which uh, tells us that evolution by natural selection explains how, how life um, uh, changes over time or different species come into existence. So, populations evolve when genes mutate and that is the slight changes in the genetic makeup is what or when we have seen in the first slide that is uh, essentially telling us. So, the this slide for example, tells us that at the cell level whatever changes that happens affects the organism and it runs through the population community and the ecosystem and that is essentially what we mean by the mutation that can happen at the molecule le molecular level. Which, uh, which changes the cell and the organism and then how the, the community get affected. So, basically the natural selection is a process which, uh, which happens at the molecular level of the DNA and that 
uh, or the genetic uh, the gene of the organism and that gets transferred to the uh, uh, to the uh, in the flow of the uh, the organization of the of life on earth so that uh, one can see how species evolve uh, in this uh, process itself so the species diversity is nothing but the variety and abundance of species in a particular place that we see uh, what is meant by variety is the number of species that you see abundance is nothing but the, uh, the the number of members of a particular species that you see so the, the species diversity or biodiversity is expressed using a, a quantity that has both the components that is the uh, uh, the number of species as well as the number of members in each species they have to be taken into account to uh, estimate the uh, biodiversity uh, species rich ecosystems why are they important they are important because they are more biologically productive and also sustainable um, in uh, under uh, circumstances such as, such as a disturbance happens or some chemical pollution happens or let's say storm or a flood or a, a drought happens in all these cases species rich ecosystems are more stable when it when it comes to stability of ecosystems uh, uh, when it comes to stability of, of ecosystems and the important th thing that we have to remember is that, that this is nothing unwanted on earth so each species has a unique role in its ecosystem which is known as ecological niche and and there are generalists and specialist uh, species in in an ecosystem but at the same time each species has a unique role to play in that ecosystem and which cannot be underestimated or under un, uh, uh, we, we cannot um, uh, Dis disregard the role played by that particular organism, particular species in a in an ecosystem. So the niche can be occupied by that particular place in the in the ecosystem can be occupied by native and non-native species. So when it when it comes to what is meant by no native and non-native is that based on species roles, uh, we can classify species into different uh, uh, different uh, uh, types. So this is the so that's why we call them native species. Native species means species which are native to that region or the native to that habitat, and non-native species which may be migratory or uh, brought by humans or uh, brought in by some other means. Mostly humans have introduced many species as non-native species which may not belong to that particular area. Sometimes food, uh, food for example, potato which could have come from a different uh, continent because it was uh, you know considered as a good um, uh, food item or it could be any other plant or organisms that were brought to various parts of the planet by human beings so they are all non native species but they form major part of food uh, today for human beings uh, so that is one of the reasons why many non native species can be found in uh, many different places then there are indicator species so they indicate the healthiness of a particular uh, ecosystem examples are fish or frog birds bees they all tell us how uh, how uh, what, what is the health of an ecosystem let's take the case of a frog or a pond for example how do we know that the pond is uh, in a healthy state or is it in, for example the water in the pond can be can can we drink the water is it healthy healthy system so many indicator species can be found for example in a pond or a lake in a freshwater system which can uh, point to the fact that the water quality is very good so for example frog frog is frog frog is an amphibian and it it, it has life in the water as well as in on the land so frog lays eggs in the uh, edge of water and the land uh, so it, it for example is very sensitive to the quality the nature of water for example the surface tension the the surface tension of water can be altered by let us say adding surface active agents or surfactants into water we all know that the surface tension will decrease so if you uh, if the water quality is different surface tension can be different pH can be different uh, the oxygen uh, in dissolved oxygen in water can be different all this affects for example the uh, existence of let us say fish, frog etc in water and that that actually indicates whether the water for example is or that uh, that ecosystem where they are living is healthy or not. So it is good to see these species like frogs around us and uh, uh, to tell us that you know the, um, the, the ecosystem is uh, healthy. So the frogs like as I said is 
actually made of a membrane which is uh, semi permeable in nature and any change any subtle changes in, in its circum in, in its environment can affect the uh, the integrity of that membrane and the uh, the frog can be either the uh, it can it can die in the in the egg state itself or it can be born with some defects and which can be observed in in the case of uh, any disturbances in its uh, in the environment or in the ecosystem so that is it it gives us a kind of indication for the quality of uh, the ecosystem that it lives similarly birds uh, world over it is show, it is seen that the population of birds in uh, many species are declining drastically due to various uh, factors such as atmospheric pollution um, uh, uh, climate change uh, global increase in temperature uh, various uh, various other human contributed factors uh, uh, habitat loss and um, lack of food all these are contributing to the decline of birds bees etc all over the world so these are indicator species which tells us that all is not well with the earth and its uh, uh, biomes and uh, which is it is time for us to wake up and then act on these issues then there are uh, two more classes which is keystone species and foundation species so these determine the structure and function of their ecosystem that is why they are called keystone species so and foundation species keystones we all know that uh, when buildings are constructed there is a keystone that starts uh, that is laid where you start the construction of the building so that uh, that is considered as the first stone that determines the rest of the alignment of every other stone that is used in the construction similarly the species determines the structure and function of their ecosystem so they have a major role to play so any given species may play one or more roles in a particular community we will take a little uh, detail look at keystone and foundation species keystone species are they they may they maintain and create habitats and several critical roles they can play such as pollination of flowering plants example a keystone species are bees butterflies sunbirds bats these are all examples of um, a keystone species uh, for example uh, without the contribution of bees or uh, many insects which can pollinate uh, plants the food availability to a major part of the planet will especially to humans will be uh, con uh, constrained to a large extent and human species can uh, face a large uh, uh, um, uh, humongous problems if bees butterflies and all these birds disappear from the planet so it is uh, so when we uh, for example for example they, they, they these species are getting uh, drastically affected by some of our activities for example when we see a mosquito or when we see a, some adverse insects we use insecticides and 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 uh, you know uh, 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 herbicides and other um, uh, weed killers and other plants uh, other uh, uh, chemicals which can harm these uh, organisms which which are playing a vital role in our existence on earth so we are com compromising the quality of existence and compromising the quality of ecosystem services provided by these organisms um, towards or to these species towards um, uh, life on earth and especially to human beings life as well and the quality of life that we have then we also have top predator keystone species examples are wolf tiger leopard that we hear always uh, or like certain sharks etc they are uh, predator species which are on the uh, on the top of the food chain and also they are keystone species how do they affect the ecosystem is by regulating the population so they uh, so their important role is in controlling the population of the uh, different species which they uh, they feed upon so that's very important role in so that for example a forest health health of a forest ecosystem um, will be dictated by the uh, tiger or let us say a leopard or a lion in that ecosystem and uh, which is important for uh, let us say reducing the number of uh, herbivore species there and the herbivores otherwise could increase and in number and could uh, feed upon all the uh, all the plants which which are use, uh, which which they can eat up so which can result in the collapse of a system for you know certain time before it recovers back so the top predator keystone species are re required for controlling the population of um, herbivore species and other other uh, uh, other plants and other other uh, links in the food web below similarly foundation species has plays a major role in shaping communities 
by creating and enhancing their habitats and ecosystem. An example is elephants. Elephants when they move around they uh, uproot trees and plants and then uh, tram trample the soil. They also turn around the, the grass uh, many times. So, the, uh, the changes that they inflict into the uh, habitat helps in uh, for example, when trees are uprooted grass uh, grasses uh, when sunlight can reach the lower bottom of the forest uh, canopy and uh, when uh, and this helps in grass to come come back and or start growing in an area where there was no grass before and herbivores will get uh, benefited greatly by this activity or for example fruit bats so these uh, for example fruit bats can um, for example um, help create uh, uh, forest back, rejuvenate forest back in a place with, where there is uh, degraded forest land because they spread, they are uh, very good uh, dispersal agents for uh, seeds and that is how they can bring back forest in places which are degraded in nature. So, their role is very important. So, we should not be like considering them as pests or disturbance just because some angle of it is not acceptable to us is not what their role in on earth in ecosystems. So, it is very important for us to consider these facts before we act upon certain things with the human centric look at the uh, living systems. So, the biodiversity um, uh, is also species interaction and population control uh, are interconnected. So, the species interaction can be of various kinds which you have studied in school itself which are interspecific and can be classified into based on predation or they could be para parasitic relationship uh, which means one is exploiting the other one. Um, uh, mutualism means both of both are benefited from each other which you would have seen uh, the, the uh, many species have this uh, helping each other. By, uh, by for example, controlling uh, say certain insects let us say which uh, uh, you know troubles certain animals. So, in the process for example, you would have, would have seen uh, when buffaloes and cows are moving in a field, you can see certain birds like uh, uh, herons or uh, other birds may go along with them. So, this could be an example where uh, both animals are benefited by the process. When animals are moving, some flies are uh, 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 flying around or insects are flying which helps the bird to uh, feed upon and also the animal also gets help from the birds uh, in, ter in turn by uh, removal of the, uh, the nuisance of the insect which are biting them. So, similarly commensalism where an example is crow which is a commensal bird which, uh, which, uh, which lives along with us and sometimes leave, uh, leaves on the uh, leftover food and other things. And so, there are species which are uh, living uh, based on human um, uh, human beings which is, a, which is an example of commensalism or many other species also could be just living on the uh, on the scrap which is left by uh, one species could be used by another one. And one more uh, important thing when it comes to species interaction is that predators and pre prey species can drive each other's evolution. How is this done? So, when predators are uh, when predators hunt a prey the prey's instinct for escaping from the predator will help it uh, evolve better strategies. For example, a, a, a prey species may evolve to become a faster runner by evolving to, uh, to escape from the predator. Similarly, the predator will also evolve because it is constantly strategizing to you know inventing strategies to, uh, uh, to get the prey which it can feed upon. So, both are evolving in the process over a long time period and that is how evolution happens in uh, such circumstances when there is prey predator relationships. Similarly, natural selection uh, uh, how it reduces competition between species. So, that is another question that comes to us. So, um, adaptation is the answer to this. So, adaptation means how if you look at uh, many different water birds. So, you can if you go and look at a marsh or a swamp area there will be so many different species of birds which are feeding there in the marsh. So, what are the adaptations for these birds if you look at they will have uh, different birds will have different length of uh, stock of le the length um, of the, the height of their legs will be different, the length of the beak will be different, uh, the, the kind of food they may be eating will be very different. So, you can see that a variety of um, food habits they will evolve as well as uh, uh, different strategies to get the food will also be evolved in the same uh, place to see. So, these are known as adaptations uh, or for example, in a canopy if there are birds which are uh, feeding in the canopy itself, they may also restrict themselves 
uh, to certain regions of let us say top uh, very very tall trees if they are predating. So, uh, if they are finding food from uh, um, uh, let us say insect eating uh, birds, they are finding foods let us say in a canopy of uh, a particular tree. So, they will evolve eventually to specialize maybe in different uh, heights of the same tree itself. So, there may be different species uh, locating and uh, looking at food, uh, looking for food at different uh, heights of the tree itself. So, this is an example of uh, how adaptation um, uh, would adaptation to a particular uh, stress that is uh, that is evolved in the environment could lead to some form of um, uh, survival strategy. So, that helps them uh, survive in, in, a, uh, in a situation where there is inter specific or intra specific um, competition between species is happening. And in, in the absence of uh, any competition, what limits the growth of population that we have seen uh, is that resources, especially the food availability is one of the important things uh, or food availability as well as for example, if it is birds or other species, how, where do they nest or where do they home? That is also an important parameter. So, nesting uh, uh, facilities, resources, when, when we say resources, it could be food, home, uh, everything that comes into the picture. Um, so, uh, with the constraints given, no population can grow indefinitely. This is applicable to human population also, uh, because the resources will be shrinking as our population keep on increasing. And population can grow, shrink or remain stable depending upon the availability of resources. And when population exceeds the carrying capacity, it can crash. So, this is the uh, summary of what we have uh, learned in this course. So, there are certain principles in ecology that we can carry home that is uh, ecosystem structure and functions are determined by the forcing functions of the system that is based on mass and energy flow uh, into the system. So, this uh, how a, an ecosystem uh, evolves and what is its structure, how it functions etcetera are determined by the energy flow and the material flow into the ecosystem. And the energy inputs to the ecosystems and available storage of matter are limited. So, based on the conservation of matter and energy. So, uh, so all ecosystems function based on the first and second law of thermodynamics. So, the energy inputs and how the energy is getting transformed uh, into material or mat uh, storing uh, and uh, how it can be stored as matter is, uh, is uh, are limited ways only in which can be stored. And similarly, we have to remember that ecosystems are not, uh, when we consider them as thermodynamic systems, they are, uh, they are open systems and dissipative systems. That means, there is loss always from the system uh, to the environment. It is not something that is, uh, it is not an, it is not a closed system. So, all ecosystems if you look at open, open systems thermodynamically. Similarly, ecosystems also have uh, a property called homeostatic capability that results in smoothing out and depressing effects of strongly variable inputs, so, which means for example, if a, if a flood or a drought or a fire happens, a forest fire happens, uh, eventually uh, through ecological succession uh, of the disturbed land, they can come back to normal, uh, some normalcy. Though the homeostatic capability is limited. Uh, and uh, it is not necessary that no, no, none of the ecosystems will go back to a particular uh, state in uh, or you know a particular uh, stable state uh, that we call. It is continuously in flux and continuously evolving. So, it is a dynamic state that it is achieving. And, and one more thing that we have to remember is these are ecosystems are self designing systems. So, the processes of ecosystems have characteristic time and space scales that should be accounted for environmental management. So, this is something that we have to remember always that the ecosystem, so when it is unlike our many human um, device processes, whether a mechanical system like a watch or a clock or a uh, helicopter or um, or a ship works. Unlike that, um, an ecosystem is something has, it has its own characteristic time. So, a, a, an ecosystem will evolve over a long period of time. It is not something that happens with, with short time scales which we can <coughs> observe and analyze. And their space scales are also different. So, they can be as small as my few micron scales to it could uh, run into kilometer scales. The space scales are can be very, very large or it could be very, very small and under which it can operate, the ecosystems can operate. So, it has to be accounted for when we are considering management of ecosystems. Similarly, 
when we are considering ecosystems as I said they are open systems and not only that they do not have clear boundaries. So, basically we need to consider the ecotones or the transition zones. These are important uh, areas, uh, important areas of uh, an ecosystem. They, they work as membranes uh, for cells. So, if you take um, biological cells, there is a, a membrane which is uh, surrounding the, uh, the cell. Similarly, each ecosystem has what is known as an ecotone area or a transition zone. For example, if you take a pond, the immediate uh, surroundings of the pond, uh, for example, can get flooded during uh, um, you know excess rains or it could uh, it could withdraw to a smaller uh, area uh, pond when when there is no rain or a drought happens so there is no clear line that you can draw to say what is the area of that pond or a, a lake or a, um, a river or an ecosystem that we are considering or a forest for example also so what is the exact uh, you know boundary for it there is no boundary so there is a there, so we need to take into account the transition zones for example seashore it is a, it's a transition zone or ri river banks, they are transition zones. So, that is why it is very important to consider coastal regulations and uh, uh, regulations uh, in constructing away from um, uh, ecologically sensitive zones and also ecotones and transition zones because animals and birds and other living creatures do not see these boundaries as we see as walls and roads or uh, such uh, uh, constraints that we put in place other creatures require to cross over to this different places and that has to be kept in mind any time when we are considering ecosystems and so for example consider considering construction of roads through forest patches so which will um, which will result in fragmentation of ecosystems or habitats and animals will be in distress or many many different species can become you know bec suffer because their water bodies or water access points could be elsewhere so these are all problems that could happen also because of this lack of these considerations the components of an ecosystem are interconnected interrelated and form a network implying that direct as well as indirect effects of ecosystem development need to be considered so so every component in an ecosystem are interconnected and interrelated and forms a network. So, so it is like uh, if you are looking at a spider's web. So, if you go and uh, disentangle one of the legs of those, uh, one of the uh, strings of the web, it becomes less functional and it can actually damage the uh, web itself. So, similar implications can be uh, thought about in ecosystems also, where we may not visualize or we, we, do, we may not always see all the connections which are existing there, which can, the, which can have uh, catastrophic effects. Uh, an ecosystem has history of development, it should be taken into account while uh, doing anything with ecosystems. So, so this is also other uh, important factor, an ecosystem is something not that has not come about uh, overnight, it has happened over millions of years and uh, including its nutrient cycling, the, the soil formation, the, uh, the different species that has come about there, all this has happened over millions of years of time. So, that has to be taken into account while, uh, while we are doing any projects or any uh, activities in this uh, uh, on earth. Ecosystems and species are most vulnerable at their geographical edges. This is also another important factor uh, or principle that we need to think about or consider. Uh, an ex example as I said is the uh, coastal zones or banks of rivers or uh, for example, um, uh, <coughs> so uh, water channels all these are or for example, even a, even a, even when we are considering a pond or a uh, or a uh, or a, uh, a well where we have fresh water and then for example, uh, it has a boundary, a geographical edge or a boundary. So, how do we uh, treat those boundaries? I mean, you can go and uh, impact those boundaries by let us say, you know, put concrete and then concretize the boundary, which may not be a good idea at all because there are so many living organisms like frogs, which actually have li life which is between the water and the land. So, uh, by concreting you may be affecting their life cycle and also affecting the well being of that ecosystem itself. So, there are many other species which are also making use of such, um, uh, such areas which are very very vulnerable and ecosystems are more vulnerable at that geographical edge. So, that needs to be taken into account and though we consider them as uh, we do not take into account these facts many times when we look at ecosystems. Similarly, ecosystems are hierarchical systems and are parts of a larger landscape. So, 
it is not that they are isolated systems which are sitting somewhere and we can tamper with it or we can do what we would like to. They are just part of a larger uh, landscape uh, and this is just a small uh, part of the system itself. So, it is important to maintain landscape diversity rather than uh, looking at you know smaller and smaller units such as ecosystems or individual species and their protection and um, uh, um, you know the um, the aspects of uh, protecting those uh, ha habitats. So, it is important to consider the main consider maintenance of the larger landscape itself uh, which, which, which it forms a part of. Similarly, physical and biological processes are interactive, it is important to know them to interpret them properly. It is not that uh, we can isolate physical processes, for example, there is a climate change, it will affect the biological processes as well or if there is a temperature change in the atmosphere, it affects our uh, well-being, uh, the biological systems which are dependent on them or uh, uh, so there are different physical processes that we have discussed, um, uh, especially the nutrient cycles and the biogeochemical cycles, all these are affecting the biological processes. So, with this uh, certain uh, guidelines about uh, ecology and how we protect ecosystems. So, there are various uh, measures which, uh, which are put in place for protecting ecosystems and biodiversity on earth and the different countries have different protocols. India also has different protocols to protect the biodiversity so, uh, and the uh, ecosystems which are very, very important for, uh, for the well-being of not only human beings but also of all other organisms which serve us lot of ecosystem functions and ecosystem services as we have described in this class and that is one of the major reasons why we need to have an understanding of ecology and uh, I would suggest reading of uh, good books on ecology uh, that is available, uh, many books are available on web also and many resources are available on the web to understand more about uh, ecology and concepts in ecology and uh, so uh, I would uh, uh, stop at this point uh, saying that recommending uh, reading more about ecology and understanding ecosystems and their importance in our lives whether we are doing a different profession of engineering or science, it is important for us to um, understand the living system or the living biomes where we are uh, located ourselves and how our activities are disturbing the uh, different ecosystems and our own existence on earth.